Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. Definitely gonna be a fun one. In this video, we're gonna go over some misconceptions we hear quite often, whether it's weekly or even daily, about turntables or vinyl records or stereo equipment that a lot of times I think it is people that are just getting into the hobby and maybe they don't wanna let on to the fact that they are kinda of new to the hobby and they're just repeating things that they've overheard other people say that maybe did know what they were talking about. And I can definitely admit to this one that I have been guilty of this in the past as well. I think most people have. You know, you start getting into something new and you maybe go somewhere where you think somebody knows more than you do. You try and repeat maybe a couple things that you've seen a few times or heard a few times so you don't feel like such a noob. But I do think these are pretty big misconceptions and pretty popular talking points for people that are at this stage and either buying a piece of stereo equipment or getting into vinyl records. So if you've heard one recently that you were like, wow, that's really just not true at all, leave it in the comments because they're always fun to read through. And I'm sure there are a lot of them out there. I'm not at the end of my journey either with learning about stereo equipment and vinyl records and everything there is to know that nobody can know everything. I'm sure there are gonna be things that I look back on in a couple years and kind of cringe myself. It's just part of life. You know, we're all trying to figure this out together. I think it's just a matter of knowing when not to die on a hill and when to say, I changed my mind or I was wrong then. And that's all it is, so. No big deal, it's just stereo equipment, it's just vinyl records. So let's get into these misconceptions we hear quite a bit, and maybe we can shine a little bit of light on it. Who knows, let's try, here we go. And by far, maybe the biggest one we hear almost daily it seems like is, vinyl records just sound better than digital. We hear this all the time, and as somebody that never quit purchasing vinyl records from a, from a kid all the way up through the 90s, the early 2000s, I never stopped. I was one of those fortunate people that was picking up Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin records for 50 cents or a dollar at garage sales and thrift stores. Even though I had a CD version for convenience, I saw value in those records for the, the history or the, the ritualistic side of putting the record on, playing the record, holding the jacket, liner notes, everything that we all love about vinyl records, I always saw that. And even at the time, I really didn't have a good record player. I would still, if I was at home and I was sitting down, I chose my records over CDs just for the engagement. So I am in no way bashing vinyl records, but to make a blanket statement of vinyl records sound better than digital is just not reality, at least in my eyes. And the main reason this just isn't true for me is that if I take a, a record that has been heavily played and I go to Walmart and I grab a entry level suitcase record player, to my ears, I would definitely rather listen to a CD version or even a streaming version to a Bluetooth speaker than to listen to a really poor vinyl record on a really poor turntable. That doesn't sound good to me at all. I think you have to put a decent amount of money into a turntable system before vinyl records get close to start sounding as good as a CD. I definitely think both formats, when they're fully optimized, you've got a great turntable, you've got a great DAC and playback system, I'll give it neck and neck even. Some things still lend themselves better to digital and, and some things still lend themselves better to vinyl for me. That doesn't mean that that has to be the same way for everybody out there. That's just my opinion. And for me, a lot of this depends on the pressing. There's a huge variance in CD quality and vinyl playback, depending on who manufactured it, who mixed it, who mastered it. I've got CDs that sound terrible. I've also got vinyl records that sound terrible. For me, it's more apparent in the mid 80s when that big shift happened. The record labels had to make a choice of where they were gonna delegate the funds as far as the mastering went. 
When you are mastering a record for digital, it is completely different than when you are mastering a record for analog or vinyl. And so if you have a budget, you want to master that music for where it's going to be dominantly played. And in the 80s, being that CD and digital was just coming out, they probably put most of the budget towards the cassette and the vinyl versions of that album. Towards the later 80s, it might have started going towards the CD. Whenever they figured out that ratio crossed is where they put their budget. In the mid-2000s, I heard that there were some mastering engineers that were mastering music for earbuds because that was the dominant format. There are just a lot of variables I don't think some people think about when they make a statement like vinyl sounds better than digital. I don't want to choose which one. I like them both. I love the convenience and the sound quality of a digital file. I also love the engagement, the physical media, and everything else that a vinyl record does, including the really good warm analog sound when it's done correctly. I don't think there's any reason to pick a side. I want both. Another one we hear almost daily is, why don't they make stereo equipment as good as they used to? My response to this question is always the same. They absolutely do. They just don't make it at a consumer level, a consumer price point, and they don't sell it at Best Buy and Walmart and Amazon. In order to get the quality of the electronics that were purchased in the 70s at every shopping mall, Sears, you name it, you have to go to YouTube videos or read magazines or get on forums that talk about the brands that are making really good quality hi-fi products. They are out there, and a lot of people think they are really expensive. It's not marketed to them, and it's a big sticker shock. And I get it. I feel the same way. But if you put inflation into the equation, it really hasn't gone up. When you look at what like a flagship Pioneer in the 70s cost, and you put that into the inflation calculator, and you wanted to buy something of the same quality, you know, you'd be in the $6,000 range, and that would get you a really nice amplifier, one from like Yamaha, the S3000. I seem to use this amplifier as a reference just because it does look so retro. It really is very similar to the specs on a CA1010 from back in the day. And they're over $6,000. I think there was a different mindset back then as far as what you purchased in that most people didn't have stereo systems in their pockets and their phones and their computer and their car everywhere else you had one stereo system and when you wanted to listen to music you went to that stereo system and you allocated a good amount of your budget to the stereo now we've got speakers and stereos everywhere and rather than having one incredible stereo we kind of go through the flavor of the month we pick up our portable stereos and Bluetooth speakers and stuff like that, and we just discard them when they're done. I'll still wave the vintage flag, mainly for the price. I just don't have that kind of money to drop $6,000 on a two-channel piece of equipment, but there's a lot of people out there that do, and for them, enjoy it. I'm, I'm fine with my vintage. It's not a problem. Very happy, so. And another misconception we hear at the shop is when we're showing a customer the receivers and we tell them this specific receiver is 15 watts per channel. And you can see the panic on their face instantly because you know they've been at Best Buy or been online and are looking at amplifiers with two or 300 watts. And the misconception there is it really depends on how the amplifier was rated. And this has kind of changed over the years. There used to be kind of a, a gentleman's handshake um, that most of the companies abided by where they would, they would base their wattage and their THD off of the 20 to 20 kilohertz spectrum. And when cheaper companies that came in trying to undermine the big dogs, they'd start boasting 2000 watts or 300 watts. I remember in the back of like JC Whitney catalogs back in the day, if any of you all remember those, you'd see car stereo head units that would say 500 watts per channel. And I remember being you know, young going, how are they getting 500 watts into that 
tiny little amplifier. They didn't tell you if that was peak, if it was RMS. They didn't tell you how much distortion there was in that power. So it was really misleading. It's not to say that you shouldn't trust what the manufacturer is telling you, but you want to know some other numbers besides just the wattage. Most people don't use more than five or 30 watts. Um, wattage to me is kind of like, it's kind of like a digital camera. Megapixels is just a, a salesman's sales tool for a lot of people. Nobody's going to blow up an image the size of a barn, but they get you on that number. And it's the same way with watts. That number's been impounded in our brain to where the more watts, the better. And it's just not true. I'm not saying don't pay attention to the wattage, but if you're really going to use that as a deciding metric of whether or not you purchase something, at least find out how they achieve that wattage rating. And if that information is not available, meh, it might give you a little pause. So just another one of those things. Almost daily, we hear it. And with turntables, we get this one all the time too. We'll have a customer come in and they either only want a drag drive or they only want a belt drive. And I definitely believe there are pros and cons with both, but I usually say what's more important is that you buy something of quality. You know, with a turntable, you want quality. It doesn't matter how that turntable turns at 33 and a third RPM for the most part, unless you're going to DJ or something like that. A lot of times, um, you know, if we've got a musician, we've got them that like to play along with their turntable. You don't want a belt drive. You want a quartz lock turntable. You want something that that pitch doesn't waver. So your guitar always sounds in tune with it or your piano always sounds in tune with it. And then we have the people that also say, well, I don't want to have to maintain the belt. That's definitely a weak argument in my opinion, only because, and this isn't their fault. They just don't realize how easy it is to change the belt on most turntables, 99.9% .9 of turntables, it shouldn't take you more than 30 seconds to a minute to change the belt on a turntable. I definitely stand behind that statement, especially with vintage, unless you are a DJ or a musician, um, by quality, I wouldn't be so much worried about the drive train as I would be worried about known issues with a vintage turntable or just whether or not it's a good reputable brand and it's performing well. And I think this was maybe the first thing I heard the first time I ever talked to somebody about opening up a vintage stereo store and I hear it still to this day and people come in and they say, aren't you worried about running out of equipment? I think this is definitely a plausible question. I've thought about it myself. But as of right now, the well hasn't dried up. We still get used vintage equipment in on a regular enough of a basis that I keep my store stocked. And that's without sourcing on eBay. I literally haven't bought anything. I maybe purchased maybe two or three items in the last two or three years on eBay. And most likely it was because somebody was looking for a specific piece. Other than that, everything we've bought or sold has walked in the door organically. They sold a lot of this equipment. I don't think people realize, once again, most people only had one stereo. This stuff was built really well. And so there was one of these units in every house in America or close to it. Therefore, there's still a lot of it out there as a lot of this stuff is still working today. So I'm definitely not saying that at some point the well is going to dry up. Um, as of right now, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen a decline in what comes in our doors. I guess we'll worry about that when it starts to happen. There's definitely nothing I can do about it when that time does come. But fortunately, word is getting out that vintage equipment has value and it's definitely keeping a lot of these pieces from going to the landfill. So the more that get repaired now and get a second life, the more they're gonna have the possibility for a third life. And I got one more misconception for you. And like always getting my thoughts together before shooting this video, I kind of thought about something, something that I hadn't really addressed before. And that is, I think there's maybe a misconception about me. 
And I truly believe that the people that watch this channel, you guys are incredible. I mean, the ratio of good comments and good feedback to negative is insane. I wouldn't have thought in a million years that I would be able to reach the amount of people that we do about this subject, which is so subjective and not need a therapist. So I can't thank you guys enough. In a lot of ways, you all watching these videos on Sunday is really going to change my life. And, and it already has. There's some really cool things that I'm excited about that are happening. People that are reaching out or people in the industry that I've made connections with that would not be possible if you all didn't watch these videos and weren't supportive. You know, it, it would be very easy for many more people to say nasty things in the comments and make this more difficult than it is for me. So I can't thank you enough. I definitely appreciate that. But when talking about misconceptions, I just want to say I am no expert. I am a hobbyist as well. I own a vintage stereo store, so I see it day to day. And that's why I did start this YouTube channel was to kind of to talk about some of these models and give some of this information out that people don't get to see because they don't do what I do on a daily basis. But I am I have not heard every set of speakers. I have not I have not heard every receiver or turntable, not even by a long shot. So if I have ever implied that my opinion is more valuable than anybody else's or, or that I have this huge wealth of knowledge of all things vintage or stereo, I apologize because that is definitely not the way I feel. I learned things about this subject and have learned things about this subject for 40 years now. I'm getting ready to turn 50 here in two months. And I still learn all the time. And I know I've said things that I don't agree with now, maybe. And I'm going to continue to do that. That's just part of life. So for all of you out there that have sent encouraging words or supported Skylabs, um, I can't thank you enough. And for the few out there that have made some snide or nasty comments, and most likely they're not watching at this point in the video anyway, I hope they get a hug or the attention they need, as that must be a really negative place to be emotionally where, you know, you're, you're trying to cut somebody down online on a subject of stereo equipment and vinyl records. So anyway, you guys pull me through it. You really do. Um, I really greatly appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out on another Sunday. And if you want to support the channel, definitely head over to skylabsaudio.com forward slash shop. I know we're not the cheapest place on the internet. I'm not trying to compete with Amazon and the big box stores. One of the main reasons behind having the web store and selling Skylabs items and merchandise there is a way for people to be able to support the channel that um, would like to get something in return as well. So, you know, if, if you need a vinyl record, uh, you want to get some Grado headphones or something, and you don't feel like giving more money to Jeff Bezos, because I already give too much to him too. you know, support a local business that really is, you know, we're just, we're trying to be honest people, trying to make an honest buck and just trying to avoid a nine to five job. And you guys have done that for me and I can't thank you enough. I really can't. We definitely got some cool things coming in the works. We do. There's going to be some cool videos coming out and I definitely appreciate you hanging out and watching another video and we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.